All right, everybody, welcome back to Musar Mondays. Uh, today we'll have another installment in our series on the 13 principles of faith. We're going to talk about the third principle, which is going to come to you live after these important messages brought to you by the local stations. This coming Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, cool, amazing women throughout Houston are going to join Mrs. Zahava Walby and create their own bouquets and have a wine and cheesecake pairing at the incredible Plants and Petals shop, uh, flower shop on Westheimer. It's only $36 per person. You come home with your own bouquet and your own vase or vase, depending how, uh, what, you know, if you're like from France, you say vase, right? Um, but you must register in advance. You must register in advance. Visit torchweb.org. I look forward to seeing you all there. Now we're back to our regular programming. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're on principle number three. Principle number three, these are the principles that Maimonides says a Jew must believe in these 13 principles to be considered a believer. You want to know what it means to be a believer in God? What's the first one? To believe in one God. One God, and uh, we said, to have perfect faith that God is the creator and ruler of all things. He alone has made, does make, and will make all things. That's number one. Number two, I believe with, per with perfect faith that God is one. Number one, okay, the first is that God is the creator of everything. Number two is that God is one. And there is no unity that is in any way like His. He alone is our God. He was, He is, and He will be. That's what we spoke about last week. This week we're up to step number three. And that is, I believe with perfect faith, that God does not have a body. Physical concepts do not apply to Him. And there is nothing whatsoever that resembles Him at all. Let's see what that means. In Yigdal, Yigdal, the song Yigdal, is divided up into the 13 different principles of faith in a hymn form. He does not have a bodily form. He is not a body. He is beyond compare in His holiness. Now let me explain something, okay? What is a body? What is a physical being? Any physical being, whether it be a fly, whether it be an animal, whether it be a human... Any form of living has a limit called a body. You know, I've said this numerous times. We've said numerous times that the, a child, when a child is born, when a baby is born, it cries. Why does it cry? Why does a baby cry? Because it doesn't want to be here. It was living in a world that was expansive, a world of souls. And now you take that world of souls, you take that baby and you crunch that enormous soul into this little body. Consider the rib, the rib cage of this little baby as a prison cell. It's like, get me out of here. I want to be out of here. Right? It doesn't want to be here. A baby doesn't want to be here. It was in a world of godliness, which is limitless. It says that God God blew into the nostrils of man a living soul. It's a part of God, so to speak. God doesn't have pieces, right? Well, we're, we're learning this in our principles of faith. God doesn't have a form. God doesn't have pieces. God doesn't have a body. So what does it mean that God gave us a piece of Himself? And that's our soul. It's the idea of a, a concept of spirituality, a concept of expansiveness, a concept of holiness that knows no limits. That's this third piece of the principles of faith, is that God has no form. And that means God has no boundaries, no limits. Our soul wants to be limitless. Our body 
is trapped. We're trapped to however tall we are, if we're six feet, however much width we have, and that's what we can do. Our soul is what helps us soar to high, to high levels. Our soul is what helps us imagine great things that are beyond what our physical is capable, uh, is capable of imagining. The third principle is that God is totally non-physical. God doesn't have limitations. We discussed this in the beginning. Can God create a stone that he can't pick up? No, he cannot. Because that would be limiting God. You can't limit God. God can't be limited by definition because God has no physical form. God, we relate to God in a way that we can understand God. Right? So we call God by certain names so that we can understand God's attributes. Whether it be Ado and Nai, right? Or Elo Kim. They all define different attributes of God's, of God's uh, uh, judgment or mercy or kindness. Yes, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, energy. Energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so God is energy. Mm-hmm. We can't we can't put a, a word or a just a nomenclature to God. Correct. The closest thing I can think of is I know we we are Well God is referred to as the end sof. Right. Hakol Yachol. Right. right. Again, th- these those are those are terms of limitless. Right. Kol Yachol means God is capable of all. En sof means there's no limit. It's an infinite. It, right? You think it's just limitless, boundless, uh, you know, without any, f- any, uh, uh, any measure of limitation. That's what God is. We believe that this unity, which we call God, is not a body or a physical force. Okay? God doesn't have... Fi- so, it, it, makes a, it makes a lot of sense when we see in our prayer book in the morning and we say the, the beautiful words in Baruch Sha'amar you please pass me the sitter right there the dark brown one right there yeah right in that shelf yeah, next one next 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 two over two over to the right two to the right yeah perfect excellent thank you yeah thank you so much listen to these beautiful words now there's different theories as to where this prayer actually came from there's an opinion that this prayer came from Abraham and there are other opinions that it came from a pitka de rekia, a paper that fell down from heaven but listen to these words Baruch Shamar olam. blessed is he who spoke and the world came into being is there any physical com- component here? No. All spiritual component. God spoke and the world came into being. Baruch Oseb Reshit. Blessed is he who maintains creation. Baruch Gozer Makayem. Blessed is he who has, who decrees and fulfills. Again, it's all verbal. It's all spiritual concepts. Baruch Gozer Makayem. Baruch Merachem Al Aretz. Blessed is he who has mercy on the earth. Blessed is he who has mercy on, his, on the creatures. Blessed is he who gives goodly reward to those who fear him. Blessed is he who lives forever and endures for eternity. Blessed is he who redeems and rescues. Blessed is, he, blessed is his name. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, the God, the merciful Father. Right? It's all spiritual concept. There's no physical element and God created. How did God create? We learned this in our breakneck through the Bible class on Tuesday nights. Ten utterances. Baruch she'amar v'haya olam. God just spoke. A physical component, not there. A spiritual component. God doesn't have a physical form. So when we relate to God in a physical capacity, it's, it's, it comes, comes empty. 
Because God doesn't have a physical capacity. It's very important. That's why one of the commandments in the Torah is not to create a, a form, a, a, a godly form. Why? Because God doesn't come in a form. God isn't a sun or a moon. They both have form. God isn't a stone. You're not allowed to bow down to stones. You're not allowed to, even to have um, things that look like uh, statues. Right? God has no form. Creating a form for God is limiting God. That can't be. Alright? So, nothing associated with the physical can apply to Him in any way. So Hashem has no representation on the physical realm. Only in the spiritual. In the all spiritual we thus cannot say that God moves, rests, or exists in a given place. But God was there. What do you mean God was there? God is everywhere. God is always there. You can't associate God with a time or a place. God is all, at all times. Things such as this can neither happen to Him, nor be part of his intrinsic nature. God doesn't catch a cold. Again, God is not limited to physical trappings, to a physical existence. Neither is God able to, uh, to be limited by, you know, being in this world. What do you mean this world? This world is a limited space. Or this universe, also limited space. God, you know, it says that uh, the whole world was tohu vavo. It was an abyss. It was in an emptiness. It means it was just an endless, an endless space of nothing. Well, of godliness. So there is an existence of God that is beyond our comprehension because we understand things in a physical realm. It was, a, it was a massive house. It was a grand event. All physical terms. God is beyond all physical. And that's what... Why? Because God is limitless. When you define something with physicality, you're limiting it. It's a beautiful table. Well, it has a limit. Every human being... By being human has a limit. God has no limit. God has no image. God has no limitations. God is one... Oh, sorry, this is wrong. Oh, no, okay. When our sages speak of God, they therefore teach that such concepts as combination and separation do not apply to Him. God can't combine with anything or separate from anything. Because any type of combination with or separation of or separation from means that there is a physical component. There is no physical component. So the only type of existence is the existence where God has no limitations. They said in the Talmud, on high there is neither sitting nor standing, neither combination nor separation. Again, all physical dimensions that God is not connected to. We are connected in a physical way. God isn't. And we'll see what this means to us and how we apply this to our day-to-day -day -day lives. How we need to live in a spiritual realm as well as a physical realm. We're limited to the physical, but we're inspired with something so great called the soul. That soul is the expansiveness of God, so to speak. It has the power of being limitless. We'll get to that. The prophet Isaiah says, To whom will you liken me? To, to what am I equal? Said the Holy One. If God were physical, 
then he would resemble other physical things. Right? But God isn't physical. So to what can you compare God? To nothing. Because the only, the only concepts we understand are physical concepts. We have a concept of time, for example. We're limited by time. We look at the clock right now. It's 8.06 p.m. in Houston, Central Standard, Central Daylight Time. And that's our understanding of time. Is, oh, it's 8.07 right now. Time. There's limitation to time. Because right now is just one moment. And now is another moment. And now is another moment. But God is not limited. So there is no concept of time in God's world. And in the Torah, the Rabbi Uzzam was teaching us a class about the spiral of energy that goes right out from, you know, things repeat, that go back and forth in, in history. And we're looking to, for sequence. Today. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> well, we know that there are several concepts <laughs> in the Torah. For example, there's no, in muktamu muhar Torah, there's no earlier and later in the Torah. Right. right? There's no chronology so to speak, in the Torah. Because it's, it's not time limited. But it has a framework of chronology. So, to what is God resembled physically? To nothing. God doesn't have a physical form. So God can't be represented in the physical realm. In many places, however, our Holy Scripture do speak of God in physical terms. Thus we find such concept as walking, standing, sitting, and speaking used in relation to God. In all these cases, though, Scripture is only speaking metaphorically. Our sages teach us Scripture is only speaking metaphorically. Our sages teach us the Torah speaks in the language of mankind. So when we hear things of that God got angry, so many ignorant people say, you see, God has a bad temper. You see, he's just like you and me. And there are many courses I can, anybody who's interested in wasting time, I can send you to Bible criticism courses. <laughs> and, and you can go to these classes that will make God to be like a human. And just like us educators in these Biblical criticism classes are limited, so too God is limited. And that's the sadness, is that people are referring to God like they're human, like God is human, like God is small like them. And it's a terrible danger, and it's a terrible tragedy that we're trying to make God into something that God is not. God is not just a bad tempered God. Oh, we see that the, the Torah tells us that God was angry. Right? That, you know, that vengeful, yeah. yeah. And, God, no, and God takes that. revenge. Jealous. And God jealous. is jealous. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. ignorance to, to misunderstand and put God into the, into, the, into the terminologies that we use just so we can understand the concept. But heaven forbid we can never use a term that is limiting God to physicality to represent God. Yes? Unfortunately, in the halls of rabbinical schools, not that, but it's not like this is going on. All right, so we're, we're not, again, we're, we're here not to, to we're not here to, we're not here to reprimand others. No, for sure. we, oh, we're, we're here You're to encourage ourselves. This is what we need to understand. 100%. We're here to encourage ourselves to think in a godly way. 100%. To think in a godly way. Yeah. And we, we can do that. We can do that. I, the truth is, you know, I want to share with you a story. I don't know how this relates to what we're talking about, but I read this story yes, uh, two days ago. And it absolutely is remarkable. A remarkable story. There's so many lessons we can take out of the story. This goes back, the story goes back about 100 years. And there was a, 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 a young man who got engaged. And at his engagement party, he stands up and he says, I would like to thank my parents for raising me, to bring me to this day, and for finding me my beautiful uh, betrothed. 
and I want to uh, I want to thank my my rabbis who spiritually have brought me to this point in my life, and I want to thank my rabbi, my teacher, who taught me in second grade. Okay. And he thanks, goodbye, and thank you, Mazel Tov, and great. Everyone walks over and says, oh, what happened in second grade? What was so special about this rabbi in second grade that of all your teachers, the second grade one was, was, your, uh, was your chosen one? He says, I'll tell you a story. There was a boy in the class who was a, came from a very, very wealthy home. And he got something around his wrist that was quite expensive that tells time. Something that was very rare and particularly an expensive watch piece. Time piece. And, uh, you know, this, this, this child in the second grade, you know, at some point had to leave the room, maybe to go to the restroom, took a bathroom break, and left his watch on the desk. And much to his disbelief, when he came back, the watch was gone. Gone. He immediately alerted the teacher, the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, okay, everybody raise your hands in the air, and I'm going to have to go through every student's pocket to find who stole this watch. <laughs>